Yeah. Uh, now we'll talk about uh, the various trials and studies, scientific studies that, that have been done in favor of role of ocular perfusion pressure. And uh, to tell you, there are large number of studies which are going on, which have been done, which have really documented the role of ocular perfusion pressure. Clinical practice was historically viewed as art of medicine and not science of medicine. And use of scientific methodology and statistical analysis was rare. In 1990, internal medis uh, medicine resident Dr. Gordon Guat introduced a new concept called scientific medicine. And this was based on the work done by his mentor, Dr. David Sackett, who is called father of evidence-based medicine. But the implication that the current si uh, uh, clinical practices were unscientific was not acceptable to his colleagues. So he came up with a new term which is called evidence-based medicine. And these are the various steps of evidence-based medicine which is case control study, randomized control trials, and on top of the pyramid is systemic reviews or meta-analysis. Now, despite extensive research over many years, the causal events leading to open angle glaucoma were not well understood, and epidemiological studies have been done, and they have made considerable contributions by determining not only the OAG prevalence, but also by identifying the various risk factors for the disease. And the consistent risk factors are older age, family history, intraocular pressure, and African history, but other potential factors, including the vascular factors, their role is still inconsistent. I've already elaborated about these trials where it has been shown that despite control of intraocular pressure, the glaucoma progression continues to progress. Uh, progress. But are these questions related to ocular perfusion pressure abstract? A recent meta-analysis of the medical literature have suggested that sufficient evidence now exists to warrant a randomized clinical trial to answer these questions so that we can have a new mode of treatment of glaucoma patients despite, besides just control of intraocular pressure. But do we have adequate evidence to justify routine assessment of ocular perfusion pressure in all our glaucoma patients? Glaucoma Consensus 2009 World Glaucoma Association came up with a very important fact that low ocular perfusion pressure has now been identified as an independent risk factor for glaucoma progression besides intraocular pressure. And these are the various studies. These are the various studies like Baltimore Eye Survey, Egna Newmark Study, Proctor, Los Angeles Latino Study. Mind you, all these are population-based prevalence retrospective case control studies. And the Barbados Eye Study, it is a population-based longitudinal prospective cohort study. And you find all of these studies indicate that diastolic perfusion pressure below a certain level increases the risk or prevalence of glaucoma many folds. So Baltimore Eye Survey was done on about 5,000 patients on this ethnic population, non-Hispanic whites, and they found less than 30 diastolic perfusion pressure increases the risk six folds. Egna New Mark, 4,000 odd patients, less than 63 folds. Preoctober, less than 54 folds. Los Angeles Latino Eye Study, less than 42 folds. And Barbados Eye Study, less than 55 millimeter of mercury, 3.2 folds. And these last two studies indicated the role not only of the diastolic perfusion pressure, but also of systolic perfusion and the mean perfusion pressure. So evidence that OPP contributes to glaucoma has been corroborated by cross-sectional as well as longitudinal studies. But mind you, current information is mainly derived from cross-sectional data by prevalence-based or the retrospective studies because very few prospective cohort studies are available. And these are, I'll just revise, case control studies go from the disease to the effect. So they are retrospective studies. Whereas prospective cohort studies go from the effect, from the risk factor or effect to the disease. So these studies are more important in uh, establishing our point of view. So incidence studies or the longitudinal or prospective studies allows determining which pre-existing factors present at baseline are related to the subsequent risk of development of the disease. And these studies have been done all across the globe in various ethnic populations with almost similar results. These are the various studies which have been done. EMGT was the first study which was done, first randomized clinical trial to document the effectiveness of treatment in reducing progression in patients with open angle glaucoma. And the extended follow-up of this study allowed us to identify new predictors. And what did it tell us? It suggested a potential role for vascular factors on progression given the positive history with low systolic perfusion pressure, low systolic blood pressure, and serious disease history. 
Baltimore Eye Survey was done on uh, the a population of Baltimore in Maryland, USA, and it suggested that there is six-fold increase in prevalence of open angle glaucoma in patients with diastolic perfusion pressure less than 30 compared to those with diastolic perfusion pressure more than 50 millimeter of mercury. And it also suggested that on stratification with age, incidence of glaucoma increases with increasing hypertension, but relationship is not explained by just increase in intraocular pressure with BP because increase of systolic blood pressure by 10 millimeter causes just 0.23 millimeter mercury in intraocular pressure and increase of diastolic blood pressure of same uh, measure increased by 0.24. So intraocular pressure raise is just not because of increase in the systolic blood pressure. Egna Newmark study was other, another study and it was a population based cross-sectional study and they suggest they studied the outcomes of prevalences of open angle glaucoma, correlation coefficient and odds ratio were computed to assess the risk of open angle glaucoma in relation to systemic hypertension, antihypertensive medication, blood pressure levels, diastolic perfusion pressure and other CVS risk factors. And what did it find? It found that there is a correlation between intraocular pressure and blood pressure both for systolic and diastolic blood pressure and there was positive correlation between systolic blood pressure and intraocular pressure and but no relationship was found between systemic diseases of vascular origin and glaucoma unlike EMGT and the prevalence of glaucoma decreased progressively with increased diastolic perfusion pressure but no correlation is de uh, detectable with systolic perfusion or mean perfusion pressure so that means only diastolic perfusion pressure was found to be important so Egna new mark I have already said no relationship between systemic diseases of vascular origin and glaucoma and diastolic perfusion pressure is an important risk factor for open angle glaucoma. Product of our study was done and these were the methods and purpose and it found a fourfold increase in open angle glaucoma among patients with diastolic perfusion pressure less than 50 millimeter of mercury compared to those with diastolic perfusion pressure above 80 millimeter of the mercury. And on studying relationship between hypertension and glaucoma, it found that there is no clear association between hypertension and glaucoma, but strong association occurs between perfusion pressure and glaucoma. See, the perfusion pressure is BP minus IOP. IOP range is very narrow, about 15 to 30 millimeter of the mercury, but perfusion pressure range is wide, 40 to 50 millimeter of mercury. So this wide range has to come from blood pressure and not intraocular pressure. So conclusion is that it recommended mandatory use of ocular perfusion pressure as a second monitoring tool in all patients of glaucoma. Los Angeles Latino eye study was done in Latino population and it found perfusion pressure of all kinds, systolic, diastolic and mean perfusion pressure increased the risk many fold, particularly diastolic less than 40 increased the risk 1.9 folds. So low perfusion pressure and also high systolic blood pressure are associated. So it suggested both low and high, low perfusion and high systolic pr blood pressure associated with higher prevalence of open angle glaucoma. Thessaloniki eye study was done in Greece and it investigated the association of open angle pseudo exfoliation glaucoma with OPP status in patients with and without antihypertensive treatment. And it found no association found between systolic perfusion pressure and either of the open angle glaucoma and exfoliation glaucoma regardless of with use or not use of antihypertensive treatment. But association was found between diastolic perfusion pressure and open angle glaucoma. No association between diastolic perfusion pressure and pseudo exfoliation glaucoma indicating it has a different mechanism. Barbatos eye study, I give a lot of importance because it was a very good study design, longitudinal study. And why Barbatos? Because it has been found that glaucoma patients of African descent have, are at a higher risk of vascular abnormalities, considering that they are increased risk of ischemic heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, CVS disease, and stroke. And they have earlier onset of glaucoma, faster progression, and more severe visual field loss. So it was hypothesized probably they have altered blood flow as a contributing factor besides intraocular pressure, increased intraocular pressure. And it again found, it, the study was done at baseline four years and nine years, and both at four and nine years, it was found that all types of perfusion pressure increase the risk of development of glaucoma many folds. So Barbatos eye study found all perfusion pressures were associated with increased risk of open angle glaucoma, weak association between low BP and OAG risk, and it found a very interesting finding that as BP increased, 
it has protection against glaucoma. In fact, they found that 10 millimeter increase in systolic blood pressure was associated with 9% decrease in relative risk of glaucoma. Blue Mountain Eye study was done in Blue Mountain population of Australia and they found that retinal arterial narrowing as an important factor for, as a risk factor for glaucoma. And they found eyes with narrowed retinal arterial and venular, venular caliber at baseline were more likely to develop glaucoma. And hypothesis is that because of glaucoma, the retinal ganglion cells die, decrease oxygen demand, and this is secondary phenomena. Canadian glaucoma study was done in Canadian population. It was again a prospective study and it found, it was thought to uh, uh, give stress to a vascular factor, but it did not give any importance to the vascular factor and the risk factors identified were positive anti-cardiolipin antibody, higher baseline age, high mean uh, intraocular pressure and female sex. Although 43 patients, 43 percent of these patients were found to be having vasospasm. Singapore Malay eye study was the first study done in Asian population. So this is of importance to us. And what did they find? They found that OAG risk was significantly higher in participants with diastolic blood pressure, diastolic perfusion, and mean ocular perfusion pressure in the lowest quartile than in the participants in the highest quartile. The GME study was done in a Japanese population. And since majority of the POG patients in Japan have low intraocular pressure, again, it was thought that the vascular factors may be important. But surprisingly, it did not find vascular factor as an important role to play. And they found only intraocular pressure, myopia, and age were significant risk factors. Leuveni study 2016 was the first of these studies to assess not only the perfusion pressure, which is a surrogate marker, but it also studied the actual calculation of the blood flow at the optic nerve head. And they found that POG patients with higher systolic and diastolic pressure when compared to healthy individuals and glaucoma patients also had lower retrobulbar velocities and higher retinal venous saturation and choroidal thickness. But there are limitations because they selected only one instrument, color Doppler imaging, did not exclude patients with systemic CVS history, and they gave questionnaire to the patient asking for self-assessment of vascular diseases, so there are inherent limitations. Leuveni study 2018 is a recent study and it was done to investigate which vascular factors and advanced vascular examinations better describe patients with NTG compared to those with POAG. And they had three multivariate regression models. One was conventional model where the patient had self-reported phenomena of vascular phenomena like migraine peripheral vasospasm. Advanced vascular model where vascular parameters and color Doppler imaging retinal oximetry was done and global where both these were included. And what did it find? It find that patients with NTG had a higher resistive index and lower early systolic acceleration in their retrobulbar vessels. But it again had limitation about the choice of the vascular device. Topical IOP lowering medication might confound vascular examination as in carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. IOP can potentially influence, uh, influence posterior pole blood flow due to mechanical compression. So NTG patients, Leuven I study concluded, have more signs of vascular dysfunction. Beijing eye study was done in China, in a Chinese population of about 3,000 sample size. It did not find any role of vascular factors. But hand and eye study, again done in China. See, there are a lot of controversies which are cropping up. But it had a smaller sample size, although it suggested that there was trend of increased risk of glaucoma with lower mean diastolic perfusion pressure, systolic perfusion pressure, and mean ocular perfusion pressure. So again, they found vascular role in patients of P. Then there is no relationship between ocular perfusion pressure. So why? Because they say that concept of perfusion is a problematic surrogate for true perfusion of the optic nerve, which can be calculated only by the instrumentation. Because adjustment for either IOP or for BP simply isolates the effect of IOP or BP alone. You cannot exclude one factor. Subtracting IOP from BP is an overly simplistic way of representing two perfusion. And the best approach to understanding how perfusion pressure relates is by instrumentation. So no independent significant effect of perfusion pressure on development of glaucoma and observed association of OPP and OAG is due to the fact that maybe OAP is, IOP is a part of ocular perfusion pressure. So studies in which ocular perfusion pressure was not adjusted for intraocular pressure. Let's go back now. Baltimore Eye 
Agna Newmark, Proctor, and previous retroderm study, they found decreased diastolic, uh, diastolic perfusion pressure to be a risk factor for open angle glaucoma. And studies in which OPP was not adjust, was adjusted for IOP, like Barbados early manifest glaucoma trial and Blue Mountain Eye study, could not find significant association between mean ocular perfusion pressure and open angle glaucoma. But Rotterdam study, if you analyze, it also has some limitation because they calculated mean perfusion pressure from brachial artery. Only one measurement was done. And all patients are, have been done in study of European descent, so cannot generalize to other population. And analyze, analysis evaluating relationship between ocular perfusion and open angle glaucoma were not adjusted for use of antihypertensive and IOP lowering treatment as was done in Thessaloniki study. So association between low diastolic perfusion pressure and prevalence of open angle glaucoma has been suggested by most of the population-based studies like Baltimore, Agna, Proctor, Barbados, I studies. And between systolic perfusion pressure and prevalence, there is a lot of controversy. Some suggest find increased prevalence with increased systolic perfusion pressure. Some find increased prevalence with decreased perfusion pressure. So systolic pro perfusion pressure as a causative mechanism has mostly been ruled out. So what is the relationship between BP and OAG? Significant association has been suggested by Agna Newmark, Rotterdam, and Blue Mountain. No association by these studies. But mean or OPP fluctuation is also very important, as been, has been suggested by these studies. So population-based epidemiological studies have told us that there is positive relationship between BP and IOP exist, but positive association between hypertension and OAG is still not well established. Low perfusion pressure of all kinds, but particularly low diastolic perfusion pressure is significantly related. And OAG is a multifactorial disease that develops from the interaction of genetic and non-genetic factors. And in, in between this interaction, probably perfusion pressure and vascular factors fit in. Virtual laboratories were, scientific studies was now started instead of surrogate studies. This was done by gentleman Dr. Alan Harris, and he gave an analogy of uh, blood flow in a network of vessels, and he compared it to current flow in a circuit. And he had three types of models, uh, different blood pressure, low blood pressure, normal blood pressure, high blood pressure, and intraocular pressure also of 15 to 45 millimeter of mercury. And he found that intraocular pressure less than 26 millimeter of mercury plus high or normal blood pressure, blood flow unchanged. But if IOP is more than 36, then the decrease in retinal blood flow occurs at a steeper rate compared to low intraocular pressure levels. So this data explains the finding of most of the population-based studies. Experimental studies have been published recently, 2015, where they found OCT angiography, and they found reduced disc flow index and vessel density in glaucoma, and this was correlated with mean deviation, retinal fiber layer, and GCC thickness. 2016, and they ca calculated circumpapillary vessel density and whole image vessel density, which was decrease in glaucoma patients, and mean vessel density was significantly lower in OAG patients. So these are the various studies which have been published. And 2018, it was found that after tribeclectomy, uh, there is significant increase in the peripapillary vessel density was demonstrated after TRAB using OCT angiography. 2018, another publication is there which uh, they have concluded that glaucomatous size shows stepwise reduction in RNFL microcirculation across severity. But many key questions still remain, as has been very nicely clarified by Dr. Kiran. Only time will tell whether the results of these studies, trials, and scientific experimental studies are leading us to a correct path, or it is simply a case of barking up a wrong tree. I think Dr. Faruqi will answer these questions by the scientific instrumentation that is there, and he, he's going to tell us in a very interesting manner, sir. Dr. Thank Faruqi. you, Dr. Bhargav.